Our subject today, understanding identity and politics in the modern Middle East, couldn't be more important, timely, and confusing. For us postmodern Westerners, who are free to be you and me, free to self-identify with whatever group we please, identity is a personal choice. We may at times suffer identity crises, but rarely do our inner conflicts reach the stage of social pathology. No wonder, then, that Westerners have such difficulty understanding the Middle East. As Lord Jonathan Sachs, former chief rabbi of the British Commonwealth, recently explained, he identified a blind spot in the secular mind, the inability to see elemental, world-shaking power of religion when hijacked by politics. The cause of that, he suggests, is that our great achievements in science, technology, the free market, and liberal democracy do not answer the three questions that every reflective individual will ask at some time in his or her life. Who am I? Why am I here? How then shall I live? We are left, says Rabbi Sachs, with a maximum of choice, but a minimum of meaning. But of course, the West is by no means the world. And Sachs predicts that the 21st century will in fact be more religious than the 20th century because of instantaneous global communications, because of the demographic explosion among religious populations around the world, and not least, quote, the failure of Western societies after World War II to address the most fundamental of human needs, the search for identity, unquote. Well, we're about to learn a great deal about the search for identity among Middle Eastern peoples, beginning with Jonathan Berkey, the James B. Duke Professor of International Studies at Davidson College, North Carolina. Professor Berkey uh, took his uh, undergraduate degree from Williams College as an Amherst uh, Lord Jep. I, uh, uh, I forgive him for that. Uh, and his PhD is from Princeton University. Um, he is an expert uh, on Islamic religious culture in medieval Egypt and Syria, but I'm delighted to say he is also a, an unabashed generalist, and he teaches the, the history of the Middle East from the beginning of Islam all the way on down to the present. Uh, he's, he's written three books, the most recent of which is The Formation of Islam, Religion and Society in the Near East, 600 to 1800, uh, and that book received the top annual book prize from the Middle East Studies Association. And he's currently writing an even broader book, if you can believe it, Shattered Mosaic, the Middle East since the rise of Islam. Please help me welcome Jonathan Berkey. Okay, well, good morning, um, and thank you all for being here, and thank you, Tally and others, for uh, having invited me. Um, I'm really happy to, to, to be here and to be doing this. Um, I've talked to a lot of teachers groups over the years. In fact, my very first job back in graduate school before I even got my PhD was precepting in an NEH summer seminar in the Middle East uh, at, at Princeton, and I really enjoy talking to these kinds of groups for a whole bunch of reasons. But basically because you all choose to be here, <laughs> you want to be here. And as much as teaching college students is fun, uh, even those who really enjoy your courses, you know, in the final analysis, they're there because they have to be there. Uh, so uh, let's have some fun uh, this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk to you for a little bit, half an hour, 40 minutes or whatever, uh, about um, identity in the pre-modern Middle East. And of course, you know, it makes me a bit of an outlier in this group, right? I'm a medievalist by training, uh, and that's where my, my, my research, uh, principal research interest lies. And I have to warn you, you know, my intellectual background, I, I come from a tradition where one of my teachers in graduate school said that, you know, uh, anything after 1500, that's just journalism. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background here uh, uh, for your study of, of identity in the uh, contemporary uh, Middle East. So we live in, I don't need to tell you this, but I'll start here anyway, we live in an age of identity politics. Um, we define ourselves by, often by one or more objective measures, measures of race or ethnicity, 
gender, sexual orientation, uh, religion, just to name a, f a few. Those measures then define who we are to others. They determine our place in society, the communities with which we associate our attitudes towards others and towards other communities. The politics of identity are fraught, and they interact in ways that both liberate and confine. On the one hand, we prize diversity. I don't know about your schools, your places of work, and your communities, but at mine, Davidson College, diversity is something that we think and talk about a lot. Diversity, whether it's racial or social or economic or cultural or religious, this is something that our admissions officers prize. If a candidate for admission is perceived to add something to the general stock of campus diversity, that individual certainly has a much better chance of being admitted to the college. Diversity is a consideration in questions of faculty hiring. And the desirability of increasing the diversity of our curriculum is axiomatic. On the whole, I think, this emphasis on diversity is probably a, a good thing, since it reflects a, a larger transformation in American life. Like it or not, the fact is that we are becoming, have become, a multicultural society. No matter what terms we use to define diversity, racial, ethnic, religious, sexual, gender, whatever, we are now more diverse than we have ever been, and we're destined to become more so. Multiculturalism isn't an option, it's the future. The only question is how and how well we're going to learn to deal with it. On the other hand, the politics of identity can at times stoke tension between the different identities which make up our social mosaic. Moreover, I think, our celebration of diversity masks a contradictory truth that we are at the same time caught up in a larger, deeper historical process of cultural homogenization. This process of homogenization is the product of the same historical forces which have encouraged us to embrace diversity. Globalization has brought us together, both individuals and entire societies. Proximity can breed contempt, but it has also contributed to the blossoming of a spirit of tolerance, which transforms diversity from something to be feared into something to be embraced. But globalization is also undermining, I think, the structural foundations of that very cultural diversity. One need only think, for example, of the alarming disappearance of distinct human languages. One language disappears, on average, every 14 days. It disappears, that is, in, the, in that the last remaining speaker of the language dies and carries with him or her the cultural legacy of that spoken tongue. There are currently 7,000 languages in daily use. By the next century, that number will have been cut in half. What sort of diversity will be possible when English, or some barbaric mutation of English, <laughs> is the only language the world's billions of human beings will speak? This tectonic process of cultural homogenization is important for us this morning, I think, because I would argue that it lies behind much of the tension and violence that has been endemic in the modern Middle East. Some years ago, um, at the invitation of a commercial press, I began writing that narrative history of the Middle East from soup to nuts, as it were, from the rise of Islam in the seventh century down to the present day. I'm on the last chapter. It's just a little, almost there. But. <laughs> One of the reasons I, I, I took up that challenge was the opportunity that the book presented uh, for me to play with an idea that had been piquing me for some time. As a medieval historian, when I look at the modern Middle East, what I see is a region which has, for the last two centuries, suffered from a series of political movements which have, in various ways, embraced the forced homogenization of cultural difference. This was true of nationalism, 
an ideology which gathered steam toward the end of the 19th century and then dominated the politics of the region for much of the 20th, whether in the form of Arabism or Zionism or any of its other manifestations, nationalism encouraged its adherents to embrace a particular expression of cultural and political identity to the exclusion of others. And nationalism has no monopoly on that exclusivist vision of cultural and political identity. It is certainly characteristic of the radical religious ideologies which are now eclipsing nationalism in much of the region. The inexorable homogenizing tendencies of these modern political developments stand out to me as a medieval historian because they present a sharp contrast to the relatively tolerant atmosphere of the pre-modern Islamic world. Now, I'm not trying here to depict classical Islamic society as a kind of happy utopia which knew no discrimination, as some apologists will do. There was plenty of discrimination in pre-modern uh, Islamic societies, and we'll talk more about that shortly. But the discrimination was a reflection of the fact that the Middle East was extraordinarily diverse. We in 21st century uh, United States, the 21st century United States, are becoming multicultural. The Islamic Middle East was multicultural from the very beginning, and its peoples had of necessity to work out mechanisms for dealing with its diversity. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about for the rest of my time uh, this morning. Now, one of the first things to note is that some of those things by which modern humans frequently define their personal and social and political identities, some of those things were simply not important to inhabitants of the pre-modern Middle East, or at least were not important to them in the ways that they're important to us. A salient example here is that of class. Americans don't like to talk about class, or more precisely, we are often told that we don't like to talk about class. But in fact, class has been one of the most important markers of political identity for the last century and a half, especially in Europe, but also here in the United States. Now, of course, some of those things which help to define a class as an analytical concept, things like wealth, occupation, property, these were naturally present in the pre-modern Middle East, and sometimes they had political implications. But class was generally not important to social and political identity, for the inhabitants of the region before the modern period. There were exceptions, although they may be exceptions which prove the more general rule. An interesting example was a group known as the Karmatians. The Karmatians were sectarian Shi'is who in the 10th century rebelled against the Islamic Caliphate and established a utopian regime uh, in Northeast Arabia. Most accounts locate their origins in peasant communities and associate their rebellion with efforts to overthrow the authority of oppressive landowners. Some accounts of the Karmatians describe them as creating a sort of classless society in which property was shared in an egalitarian manner, their property and their women too. Those accounts may reflect less what the Karmatians actually did than what their Sunni enemies believed that they did but even if there was a kind of leveling, a flattening out of social distinctions based on wealth, this did not necessarily result from what a Marxist would call class consciousness. Rather, it was driven and justified by a radical religious creed grounded in millenarian expectations, that is, in expectations of a looming end time when the chosen instrument of God's will would overthrow a corrupt social and political order. By contrast, one of the principal markers of personal identity in the pre-modern Islamic world is, theoretically at least, absent from our own, namely the distinction between those who were slaves and those who were free. Slavery was a widespread phenomenon in the Islamic Middle East. In Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire at the turn of the 17th century, Approximately 20% of the population held slave sta status. Slavery is one of the more difficult aspects of medieval Islamic social history for Westerners to comprehend for reasons, I think, that have more to do with our own rather than Muslim experience. 
Slavery took many forms in the pre-modern Middle East, but in general it meant something very different than what it did say in the antebellum United States. There was very little brutal plantation style slavery in the pre-modern Middle East. Most slaves served in some sort of domestic capacity as cooks, cleaners, household servants, and as such were frequently treated in effect as members of the owner's families. Certain types of slavery carried with them an almost exalted status. Concubines, for example, female slaves purchased specifically for the sexual pleasure of their masters, often held a position in the household not at all inferior to that of freeborn wives. And if a concubine bore her master a child, that child was free and fully legitimate, no less so than the offspring of a man and his wife. Other markers of identity, which, were, which are common in our world, were also common in medieval Islamic societies, although the experiences of them in those two settings differ significantly. Take, for instance, ethnicity. And I would begin parenthetically by remarking that I would prefer in this discussion to avoid the term race, and not only because, as contemporary biologists will tell us, race is meaningless as a scientific as opposed to a social category. Some of what many people nowadays take to be markers of race, skin color, for example, were issues of social importance in pre-modern Islamic societies. They lacked, however, the historical baggage which they carry in our own society. It's difficult to find anything comparable to the racist attitudes and politics characteristic of American history in the pre-modern Muslim experience. And so the use of the term race in the present context, I think, may distort more than it clarifies. So on the whole, I prefer to, to avoid it. But ethnicity, that is, social distinctions rooted in cultural and especially linguistic differences, distinctions which may, under some circumstances, have political consequences. Ethnicity was definitely a meaningful marker of identity in the pre-modern Middle East. And a comparison to our own conceptions of ethnicity is therefore, I think, uh, a useful exercise. On the one hand, there is an important principle of Islamic law that ethnicity should not matter. We have created you male and female, says the Quran, and have made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. The usual interpretation of that verse from the 49th surah of the Quran is that what we would call the ethnic diversity of the human race is a sign of the splendor of God's creation. No one, no ethnic group, no tribe is to be preferred to any other. We are all equal in the eyes of God. The only thing which meaningfully and legitimately distinguishes one human from another is the degree of their individual piety. That egalitarianism became a distinct and, I think for most Muslims, a normative element uh, in Islamic juristic discourse. Nonetheless, ethnic identity mattered and it shaped political experience in many ways. Perhaps the most important example is the way in which Arab identity shaped the contours of the early Islamic polity. This is not an easy matter to discuss, in part because of the egalitarianism I referred to uh, a moment ago, an egalitarianism that is deeply embedded in modern constructions of Islam. By the time a consensus had been reached about the substance of Islamic law in the 9th and 10th centuries, Islam had largely been detached from its Arab roots, and Muslim discourse had come to insist upon the priority of religious rather than ethnic identity. But that was the end result of a long and contentious process. There's much debate uh, among historians over these matters, but in broad terms, it is probably fair to say that in its origins, 
Islam was tied very, very closely to Arab identity. Islam was probably conceived of by its earliest practitioners as a monotheistic faith specifically for the Arab people. The Jews had their religion and the Christians theirs. Islam was a monotheistic faith for a people, the Arabs, who had not previously been given their own revelation. For some decades after the rise of Islam, in order to convert to the new faith, a non-Arab couldn't simply embrace Islam. It was necessary for a Muslim Arab or his tribe to embrace that person as a client, a sort of adoptive Arab status. Over the first century of Islam, several caliphs actively discouraged the conversion of non-Arabs to Islam for complex reasons, not least because the conversion of non-Arabs would undermine the tax basis of the early Islamic state. Now, Eventually, the pietistic view that, as the Quran said, the most noble of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you, that view won out. Nonetheless, the preeminence of the Arabs in early Islam left its residue on later, more cosmopolitan versions of the faith. So, for example, there are plenty of statements from the early Islamic period, some of them attributed, probably inaccurately, to the Prophet himself, that Arabs should refrain from marrying non-Arabs. As late as the ninth century, an Arab poet could write a satirical poem comparing the miscegenation of Arabs and non-Arabs to Arab women fornicating with donkeys. The ethnic hierarchy of early Islam survived in a rather arcane doctrine of Islamic law, which allowed a woman's male guardian to object to her marriage to a socially unequal male. And one of the recognized grounds for such inequality was the preeminence of pure-blooded Arab families. More important is the consensus of Islamic political, Islamic political theorists that a legitimate caliph can only be chosen from among the descendants of the Prophet's own tribe, Arab tribe of Quraysh. This principle has actually played a role in quite recent political developments, as the so-called Islamic State has gone to great lengths to establish that its current caliph, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is in fact an Arab of Qurayshi descent. Now, to be sure, there was nothing in the pre-modern Middle East resembling ethnic nationalism. Nationalism as an ideology uh, is a peculiarly uh, modern phenomenon. It's the product of historical contingencies, for example, the rise of a politically active middle class, which really were not in place before the 19th and 20th centuries. Before the 19th century, I think it would rarely, if ever, have occurred to most Arabs or Egyptians or Jews or Turks that what we would call their ethnic identity should be the fundamental basis of political community and of legitimate government. Nonetheless, people were aware of ethnicity and sometimes ethnic identities clashed or found themselves in competition. Other than the complex relationship of Arab and Muslim identity, the most important example of an ethnic identity with political ramifications was that of the Turks. Beginning in the late 9th century, growing numbers of Turks from Central Asia began to infiltrate the Islamic Middle East. Turks were praised and valued for their martial abilities, and they soon constituted the core of the Muslim Empire's armies. And before long, those same Turks became politically dominant, eclipsing and eventually replacing the authority of the previously established Muslim governments. From the 11th century down into the modern period, the ruling elites in most states in the Middle East consisted of groups who were, in some sense, Turkish. Consequently, Turks, as an ethnic group, became associated in people's expectations with government, with ruling. According to an apocryphal statement in an 11th century text, Muhammad advised his followers to learn the language of the Turks, for their dominion will be long. That association of Turks with government was probably a factor in perpetuating uh, the long, drawn-out twilight of Ottoman rule in the Middle East, although ultimately it was also, I think, a factor in the rise uh, of Arab nationalism, something you'll discuss later on today. <laughs> 
Now, another important marker of identity in the pre-modern Middle East was gender. Gender is important to us as well, although it is so in ways that make the gender constructs of an earlier period seem almost quaint. Gender probably shaped an individual's experience far more firmly uh, than any other marker of identity. After all, a slave might always be freed, and slaves frequently were slaves. Manumission was a very common uh, action. Uh, and a Jew or Christian might convert to Islam. By contrast, a man was a woman, and a, a, a woman was a woman, and a, a man was a man. That notion of a, a flexible construction of gender being completely incomprehensible to the inhabitants of the pre-modern uh, Middle East. And I think it's you know, easy for us, too, to forget just how radically novel the notion of flexible gender is. Um, I'll bet that some of you <laughs> Uh, can remember Archie and Edith Bunker, <laughs> the fictional characters in the long-running TV series All in the Family, uh, singing nostalgically in the title song, and you knew what you were then, girls were girls and men were men. <laughs> the importance of gender uh, as a marker of identity is apparent to anyone with even a superficial knowledge of Islamic law. It was not simply that the lawyers spent much time outlining the responsibilities of women uh, regarding matters such as marriage, uh, the family, sex, child rearing, other matters which might have special resonance in women's lives. It was also that one's gender defined one's rights and responsibilities in a variety of more public arenas. For example, where and how one should pray, or whether and what a woman might expect to inherit from her father, or what value would be accorded to her testimony in a court of law. <clears throat> so important was gender identity to the Islamic lawyers that they went to great lengths to resolve those rare cases in which an individual's gender really was, that was, this was objectively ambiguous. Hermaphrodites, or what are called now intersexed individuals, who had external genitalia of both male and female, posed an almost existential problem for the classical Muslim lawyers. As the Quran made clear, gender was a part of the fabric of the universe. And so every individual had to be either male or female. A person could not be both. More immediately, one's social role was largely defined by gender. So for example, in a mixed congregation, men should pray at the front, women behind. The prayers of a man who prays while standing behind a woman are invalid. So what were the lawyers to do with an individual whose sexual identity on the basis of his or her external genitalia was ambiguous? Well, what they did was go to great lengths to establish criteria for determining gender, crafting, for example, elaborate rules for observing whether a hermaphrodite urinated as a male or as a female, or in cases where it did both, <laughs> measuring the quantity of urine which emerged from the male and female organs. In Islamic constructions of political authority, however, there was no ambiguity whatsoever. The jurists were virtually unanimous in insisting that politics was an exclusively male arena. This despite the well-known political roles played by some of Muhammad's wives. Some especially pietistic jurists were willing to dispense with the ethnic requirement that a caliph must be a Qurayshi Arab. Their emphasis on piety and competence was reflected in their dictum that anyone could be a caliph, even, the phrase went, a slit-nosed Abyssinian slave, so long as he ruled justly and administered the Sharia. But even they, for the most part, could not countenance the possibility that a woman might serve as caliph. There were only three instances, at least of which I'm aware, in, the, uh, in which women ruled over Muslim states in their own names before the modern period as sultans, a title adopted by most medieval dynasties in place of the earlier title caliph. The most famous of those involved a woman named Chadra Adur, the concubine of a sultan of Egypt in the mid-13th century, 
who was briefly raised to the throne and even had coins, one of the principal markers of sovereignty, uh, minted in her own name, until a message arrived from the caliph in Baghdad that emphatically rejected the right of a woman to rule. Now, of course, formal rule is not the same thing as political power. Human relations being what they are, there were episodes when women might play an important political role behind the scenes. Not infrequently, these episodes provoked the wrath of male jurists and historians. Prompted by the influence wielded by the women of the imperial household, an 11th century Persian, Persian vizier warned his monarch about the wiles of women. Ottoman observers condemned the long period in the 16th and 17th centuries when the mothers and concubines of the reigning sultans wielded considerable power, a period the critics dismissed as the sultanate of the women. Such episodes aside, however, politics, more than any other sphere of life, was one in which gender identity formally and definitively circumscribed public behavior. Now, finally, of all possible markers of identity, the most important and far-reaching, of course, was that of religion. What is especially interesting about religious identity is that it lay at the heart of the extraordinary diversity of the pre-modern Middle East. On this, more than on almost any matter, we who live in the contemporary West stand to learn something, I think, from how medieval Muslims and others negotiated the stunning and complex religious diversity of their societies. Let's start by remembering that Islam is a diverse phenomenon and that the Muslim experience has been very different in different times and different places, just as one might say the Christian experience in 21st century America is rather different than, say, Spain during the Inquisition. God is one, or so at least Muslims, along with Jews and Christians, proclaim. Muslims, perhaps a bit more insistently than others, or at least uh, than uh, Christians. This was, by the way, brought home to me very clearly once when I was living in Cairo uh, and went to a, a, a bookstore and I was buying some, some, some books, some medieval books, printed things, and I took them up to the front desk table and there was at that front table uh, three young men sitting uh, and uh, sipping coffee and smoking cigarettes. If you go to almost any shop in Cairo, there would be three young men at the front sipping and sitting coffee and smoking cigarettes. And they looked at the stuff I was buying and they looked up at me and, and said uh, uh, in Arabic, are you a Muslim? And I said, no, I'm just a historian. Um, <laughs> and he, he, he proceeded to say, he said, he said, some people, we say that God is one. Some people say that God is three. What do you say? And what I said was, uh, it was a very interesting question. I'd love to stay and chat about it, but I had an appointment that I had to get to, and maybe, maybe later we could discuss that. So even if God is one, right, uh, humans have never been able to uh, agree about very much more concerning the divine, about how God should be worshipped. Uh, that's just as true of Muslims as it is of others, and their differences of opinion have had a profound impact uh, on how Muslims have understood their own religious diversity. Now, the major division uh, within the Muslim world is that between the Sunni and Shi'i branches of Islam. In the wake of the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1978-79, uh, which, as some of you will remember, mesmerized this country's attention during the last year of Jimmy Carter's presidency, Many Americans came to hold a number of mistaken perceptions, I think, about Shi'i uh, Islam. For example, because Iran is overwhelmingly Shi'i, and because the Iranian revolution was waged on specifically Shi'i terms, many Americans came to think of Shi'ism as a specifically Iranian form of Islam, as something that distinguished Iranian or Persian Muslims from Arab Muslims. It's true, of course, that the vast majority of Iranians are Shi'is, although that has only been true for the last four or 500 years. Before the year 1500, that is in the pre-modern period, uh, 
Most Iranians, like most Muslims generally, were Sunnis. But in no meaningful sense is Shiism a specifically Iranian form of Islam. Nor is it a particularly radical form of Islam. The Ayatollah Khomeini's interpretation of Shi'i Islam was a radical one, that is one that posed new and unusual answers to some of the recurring questions of the Shi'i Islamic tradition. But as we now know, there are plenty of radicals on the Sunni side as well. What then is the difference between Sunni and Shi'i identities? Well, the root of the difference is a historical one and a political one. Basically, it has to do with how you feel about certain events that took place almost 1,400 years ago. This is an immensely complicated question, and reconstructing the historical narrative from the surviving evidence is difficult. But in a nutshell, the story is this. When Muhammad died in the year 632, he left no instructions about who was to succeed him as leader of the Muslim community. Some Muslims came to feel that leadership should have passed, as it apparently did, in fact, to some qualified individual who was chosen and recognized by the community at large. There was no question about this individual inheriting Muhammad's status as a prophet, but most Muslims came in time. The process took, you know, a couple hundred years. They came to feel that the political leadership of the community should be vested in, excuse me, in, in some qualified individual who would be chosen through a process of consensus. Religious authority, by contrast, passed to what the tradition calls the, the ulama, literally those who know, that is the religious scholars. Anyway, over time, and this process of separating Muslim sectarian identities took time, quite a bit of time, well over a century. Over time, these Muslims are those who came to be known as Sunnis, and today they constitute you know, maybe 90% of Muslims worldwide. But other Muslims felt differently. For them, leadership of the community and absolute authority over both its political and religious affairs should have passed after Muhammad's death to his cousin and son-in-law, a man named Ali, and after Ali's death to his sons and descendants, that is, to the descendants of Muhammad himself. This group came to be known in Arabic as the Shi'at Ali, the party of Ali, that is, the Shia. They set themselves apart from other Muslims by their conviction that the community had made a terrible mistake in not ensuring that Ali and his descendants held effective rulership and that the community would be acting in contravention of the will of God until through some political revolution, the rightful heir of Muhammad through his son-in-law Ali was recognized as imam or leader. In other words, the difference between Sunni and Shi'i identities has nothing to do with being Iranian or radical or anything like that. Rather, it's a fundamentally historical difference and also a political one. The second issue concerning religious identity I want to address is perhaps an even more interesting one, namely the historical relationship between Islam and the diverse religious communities of the Middle East. Islam was born into a world of diverse faiths. Judaism and Christianity, of course, but also other historically significant, although perhaps now less well-known traditions, such as that of the Zoroastrians in Iran. Indeed, the very idea of religion as we know it, that is, religion as adherence to a discrete and mutually exclusive body of convictions and practices, that notion of religion as a marker of identity uh, is one that is a product of the religious competition which characterized the Middle East in late antiquity at the rise of Islam. That means that Muslims from the very beginning had to do what American Christians are only now learning how to do, that is to live in a world in which theirs is not necessarily the dominant faith. How did they do so? Well, the first thing to say is that the recurrent image that many have in the West uh, of Islam spreading through the sword uh, is, is very misleading. As a general rule, forced conversion is repugnant to the Islamic tradition. Now, of course, there have been exceptions, but by and large, Muslims have adhered to the Quranic principle that 
There is no compulsion in religion. Religious decisions, that is, must be made freely. Now that's not to say that Islam has not had a violent side. The seventh century of the Common Era was one of the most decisive in human history precisely because it was then that the newly converted Muslim Arabs swept out of Arabia and within a hundred years had conquered all of the territory between the Atlantic Ocean and the borders of China. But during that period of conquest, when Islam really did, in a sense, spread by the sword, there was little effort to convert those who came under the rule of the Muslim Arabs. For almost a century, as I mentioned a while ago, the Muslims thought of Islam as the monotheistic religion of the Arabs. Hence those efforts I mentioned earlier to discourage conversion by non-Arab peoples. It was only later, from the 8th century on, and in part through competition with the universalist imperative of Christianity, it was only later that Muslims overwhelmingly came to think of their religion as one that was addressed to all of humankind. And that points to a second element of the Islamic history of interfaith relations, which is also important. Namely, that for Muslims, the question of religious identity has also had a political dimension. Our notion that the sacred and the secular can and should be separated, that church and state represent distinct spheres of practice and authority, this is in many ways an odd one in human history. Some have argued that it has roots in Christianity itself. Jesus, after all, is quoted in the Gospel as urging his followers to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and unto God that which is God's. More historically, it's true that for its first three centuries, the church grew up not so much in opposition to the state, but in a separate sphere from the Roman state. But in fact, after the conversion of the Roman emperor to Christianity in the fourth century, Christians learned very quickly how to wield political power, and for the next thousand years consistently defined their political institutions in explicitly religious terms. The separation of church and state, the separation of the sacred and the profane, is really, in fact, a product of the Enlightenment of the 18th century. It's the Enlightenment, together with the Enlightenment's skepticism regarding absolute religious truth, which has left a secularist legacy on our own society. The separation of religion and politics is thus a very recent thing. From the very beginning, by contrast, Muslims have claimed to find in Islam political as well as religious authority. And ever since the seventh century, Islam has been the religion of those who wielded political power in the Middle East. For the whole of Islam's history, in other words, Muslims have been in charge. Indeed, in the medieval period, Muslim jurists debated amongst themselves whether it was even possible to live as a Muslim in a land that was not ruled by Muslims. Now that suggests a third and final point, namely that the very principle around which many of us might frame the question of interfaith relations, that is of equality, simply was not historically an issue for Muslims, at least until the eruption on the scene of Western secular political ideas in the last century and a half. There is no question that in pre-modern Islamic societies, non-Muslims were treated as second-class citizens. Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians living under Muslim rule were subject to certain restrictions on what they could wear, on how they were to treat Muslims, whether they could carry arms or ride horses, the degree to which they could build or repair their houses of worship, what special taxes they had to pay, all that seems to us, committed as we are to the principle of equality, to be unfair. But it may be that equality is the wrong way to think about the problem, at least as far as the pre-modern Middle East is concerned. In the first place, it is certainly the case that Jews and Christians in the pre-modern Middle East were treated much better than were religious minorities, Jews mostly, living in Christian Europe. For the most part, Pre-modern 
Muslim history is devoid of the kind of pogroms and massacres which medieval and early modern Christians often inflicted on Jews. So, for example, when the Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella drove the Jews out of Spain in 1492, many of them ended up in the Ottoman Empire, which they chose as a place of refuge because of the relatively high degree of tolerance and freedom they found it there. In the second place, as my teacher at Princeton, Bernard Lewis, was fond of observing, second-class citizenship is a form of citizenship. Not perfect, perhaps, by modern standards, but respectable for its day. And so while Jews and Christians suffered from certain restrictions and even from certain humiliations, they were also guaranteed the protection of the Muslim state and were allowed a fair degree of autonomy to order their lives and direct their own communities as they saw fit. And so, for the inhabitants of the pre-modern Middle East, as for us today, uh, identity was uh, a fraught and complicated matter. Identity shaped who they were, uh, what sort of communities they belonged to, how they related to the body politic. What was fundamentally different, I think, is that for most, Identity involved little or nothing in the way of choice. For us, of course, it's an entirely different matter. So with that, I think I'll bring my formal remarks to an end. And uh, for as long as we have time, be delighted to, to talk about all of this with you, answer questions, or respond to your comments. very much, Professor Berkey. Uh, we'll now take questions. Uh, Peyton has the microphone, so please wait till she comes to you as we are recording this for our website. Thank you, um, Mr. Berkey. My name is John Larkins. Sorry. And my question is about gender. Talking about these, uh, the Muslim world and, or teaching about Islam or what's going on in the Middle East with my students, um, gender seems to be the issue with which my students have the biggest issue with. I bet. Uh, um, yep. Trying to maintain a sense of um, objectivity. And I'm curious to, to know a little more about where the Islamic roots of their views on gender come from? Was it from earlier uh, tribal Arabic practice? Was it uh, sort of mimicking some of what the, 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 the Romans had done? Sort of where that came, or was it more based on uh, Old Testament connections to, you know, the, um, what Christians and um, Jews views? I'm just curious to hear what you might have to add to that. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to answer the question in any definitive way. There's a lot of uh, debate among historians uh, about those questions. Um, and, and part of the problem is that the situation in, in pre-Islamic Arabia uh, is, is, is really opaque to us. They're just, it's very difficult to find the sources that allow us to reconstruct uh, with any degree of confidence uh, the situation in Arabia before the coming of Islam, or even in the, the, the early Islamic period. There does seem to be um, kind of contradictory evidence uh, as far as the question of what was the place of women in pre-Islamic uh, Arabia. That is, were women kind of better off than they were later under uh, Islam, uh, or were they worse off? There's contradictory evidence. So, for example, it is pretty clear from evidence in the Quran itself that uh, the female infanticide was practiced in, uh, in pre-Islamic Arabia. That is, boys were prized, and sometimes um, uh, baby girls would be left exposed, left out to die, um, uh, the practice of female infanticide. On the other hand, there is also some evidence um, uh, for uh, polygyny in pre-Islamic uh, Arabia, that is for women having more than one husband, uh, at, at one time, that is, as well as uh, uh, 
no, I'm sorry, that's polyandry. Polygyny is, all right, there is evidence for, for both polyandry and polygyny in, in, in pre-Islamic Arabian society. So the situation there is very unclear. It is clearer, I think, that some, anyway, of what we take to be uh, characteristic features of the subordination of women in Islam are quite possibly things that the early Muslims um, learned from the peoples whom they conquered, from the, uh, from the Romans, uh, from the uh, Persians, from the Iranians, um, the practices of veiling, for example, and the seclusion of women. These are things which were probably practiced in uh, pre-Islamic Near Eastern cities, Roman cities, and Iranian cities. And um, they may not have been unknown in Arabia, but they were probably not as widely practiced there. And in adopting them, the early Muslim Arabs were in a way kind of imitating the peoples whom they conquered, which is actually a fairly common thing in human history, right? The conquerors become like the people whom, whom they conquer. So it's a very, if you, if you want to know where these things come from, it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated um, uh, question. One thing that, that I try to emphasize to my own students because you're absolutely right, the thing that they obsess about is women and how women uh, are treated. One thing that I do try to stress to them is that in this, on this matter as on virtually everything else, Islamic practice is enormously diverse, right? Uh, that that, that to, to characterize one particular thing as being distinctively Islamic, uh, to make veiling, say, normative for Muslims generally, uh, is, is a real mistake. If you just look at the contemporary world, there's an enormous variety uh, of practice on the question of women and their place in, in, in public life. And as an example, uh, I tell them, you know, do you know how many major Muslim states there have been which in the last three decades have had female heads of state? And there are at least four I can think of, uh, Turkey, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Um, so far, the United States hasn't had one, <laughs> right? So, so, and I mentioned that just by way of, of kind of complicating the picture for them. This is not to say that there, there aren't elements in the Islamic tradition which, you know, from our viewpoint, are quite oppressive uh, of women. But Muslim practice, that is to say the practice of people who identify themselves as Muslim, is enormously diverse. You mentioned the importance of ethnicity uh, as opposed to race. And then you talked about how um, ubiquitous slavery was. Mm -hmm. So was within slavery, was ethnicity and maybe even class uh, really distinct? For example, did people from a certain ethnic yeah. group, were they more prized as slaves, uh, yes. concubines, or even on the class issue? How did that get stirred Absolutely, up? it was a huge issue. Uh, slaves. Um, First of all, you need to understand that, that, that uh, basically, basically somebody living inside the Islamic world can't be enslaved. Slaves can only come from outside. So they are either uh, the product of, of capture during the course of a war of expansion, uh, or they are brought in uh, through, through, through a slave trade. So where did slaves in the pre-modern Islamic world come from? Well, <laughs> the pre-modern Islamic world, you know, geez Louise, I mean, we're talking about a big territory in a long period of time, so it's hard to generalize. But, 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 but that said, um, they came from three principal areas, from, from sub-Saharan Africa, uh, from Europe, um, uh, uh, Slavs, for example, the word Slav and slave are etymologically related, right? And, uh, and then uh, also these Turkish peoples and others from, from Central Asia. And Typically, there were kind of um, uh, ethnic differences in the way in which people coming in, slaves, were, 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 were treated. You, you, you purchased different kinds of people for different purposes. So for the most part, um, uh, black African slaves were purchased for uh, domestic purposes as domestic help, cleaners, cooks, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, concubines, there was a whole hierarchy of, of, of kind of ethnic differences uh, for concubines. In fact, um, uh, there were manuals published, uh, guidebooks, basically for people looking to buy concubines, you know, which 
ethnic groups made um, the best ones. Uh, the most famous of these maybe was written by a, a Christian, actually, a, a Christian doctor from the 11th century, in which he says, you know, the uh, Armenian women are good for this, and uh, Circassian women are, are good for that. Um, typically, the lighter the skinned, uh, uh, the more highly uh, uh, the concubines were valued. Not exclusively, however, um, Abyssinians were, were very highly priced as, as concubines. Um, and then there were the, the, the most interesting category of, of slaves of all, and in a way the most distinctively Islamic, which I, I didn't mention, uh, were slave soldiers. Uh, I guess by, from the late 9th century on, um, uh, slaves typically constituted the core of the armies of the Muslim states. These were people, slaves who were brought in from outside, from different ethnic backgrounds, but by and large, generally speaking, Turkish, from Turkic peoples uh, of Central Asia, who were brought in as slaves, trained to be soldiers, uh, and then typically at the end of the process of training, they were manumitted, so they were all you know, sort of ex-slaves. Uh, but those, those slaves and ex-slaves constituted the core of Muslim armies uh, from the late 9th century down into the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, uh, anyway, so uh, it's, a it's a phenomenon that's, that's known as the Mamluk phenomenon. The word Mamluk uh, means, um, well, it means something that is owned, a slave, but it refers specifically to military slaves, to, to these, these slaves who were brought in in order to be soldiers, in order to be the governing elites, in other words. Right, so that's a good marker both of, of, of how important ethnicity was in determining you know, what kind of functions slaves had, uh, but also of the diversity of the slave phenomenon, right? That, that, these, that this last group, they were the rulers. They were the, they were the elites. So there's... I had a question for you about the uh, religious minorities. And I understand that, especially in the, the Ottomans, that the minorities were guaranteed protection. Um, but in, in just thinking about it today, as, as you were saying that, I was thinking, well, then, if there is the, this tolerance why do they, they need the protection? And, and so I I'm, I'm, I'm guess I'm, it's twofold. I'm hoping that you could perhaps explain to me, because forgive my lack of knowledge here on this, uh, you know, I've read about religious millets or those areas where, where different groups lived. I, I'm not quite sure in terms of vocabulary. And then were the Janissaries indeed charged with protecting those areas? Or, and, uh, and why was there the need? The, the Turkish word millet, uh, the Arabic word milla, um, uh, doesn't mean an area. It means... It can mean different things, but it basically means a, a community. Uh, it, it can, in some circumstances, mean a, a nation. The term is sometimes used in, in modern uh, uh, versions of the languages to refer to a nation. But here, what it's referring to is a distinctive religious community. So there was the Jewish millet and the Greek Orthodox millet and the Armenian Catholic uh, millet. Um, and those communities, of course, existed you know, before the Ottoman Empire, too, in, in, in pre-Ottoman uh, Islamic societies. But what comes to be a little bit different in the Ottoman case, and this is typical of, of Ottoman society in general, is that there's a kind of a, um, institutionalization, of, of a regularization uh, of these communities. They, they acquire a kind of a hierarchy, and they become, uh, you know, eventually, kind of almost the, the leaders of those communities become officers of the states. They become closely tied, that is, to the political structure uh, of the Ottoman state more so than in previous, um, than in previous uh, Muslim governments and, and societies. Um, it, these non, whether we call them millets or, or just the, 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 the Jewish community or Christian community or whatever, um, the, the basic idea here is that these people had a covenant of protection with the Islamic State by which the state agreed to protect them, them, and basically that meant leaving them alone to do what they wanted, to worship uh, as they saw fit, to ad administer their own affairs uh, in ways that were appropriate uh, for them. I mean, the leaders of the religious communities had considerable authority uh, over their communities, not just over, you know, liturgical things, but over social affairs, too. Uh, um, and in exchange, 
they agreed to do certain things and not do certain things, which had the effect of marking them out as subject communities and uh, acknowledged their um, subservience to the Islamic State. So they might um, agree to wear certain colored clothing. Um, and that was really, it, it's an interesting thing actually because um, it's a reminder that there was very little in the way of ghettoization in these societies. One of the reasons why it was important for you know, Jews to wear one color clothing, Christians to wear another, is so you could tell who was who. They were all mixed together with Muslims. And, and, and you needed to know who was who, was who you know, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, for business reasons, for personal reasons, for social reasons. Uh, and that was one way of, of doing it. It was also something, all of these restrictions, of course, are things that were more valued uh, in the breach than in the observance. Um, we have repeated, repeated, uh, there are repeated episodes in the historical sources about uh, a Muslim ruler waking up and saying, hey, we've got, to, if, you know, we've got to impose these rules. Over and over again, you get that in the medieval chronicles, which is, of course, a sign that the rules weren't being applied, <laughs> that they had to repeat them constantly as a sign that, that, in fact, they were more honored in the breach than, than in the observance. So that's the basic. It, it would vary from place to place, uh, of course, um, but that's the basic, um, uh, the basic uh, sort of s schematic way in which uh, non-Muslim communities uh, related to Muslim rule. Now, one thing I didn't mention that, that is kind of interesting here has to do with conversion. Bear in mind that, you know, down into it, it, the process of conversion to Islam is one of the most difficult things for historians to, to trace because we just don't have much in the way of, of reliable data to, 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 to measure it. Um, there have been some very, very creative efforts to do so, um, uh, but it's a hard thing to do. But as a general rule, it's probably fair to say that in most parts of the Middle East, uh, a majority of the population was non-Muslim, at least until the 10th century, maybe the 11th uh, in some places. Um, Lev Weitz, who's going to be speaking to you this afternoon, can probably speak more authoritatively to that than, than I can, because that's kind of his, his field. But it took a long time. It took several centuries for a majority of the population of the region to, to convert to Islam. I'm confused about like the geographic extent of Arab identity, especially Egyptians. Why why do Egyptians identify as Arabs? And, well, and the whole of North Africa. <laughs> you're you're going to hear more about that this afternoon. I don't want to steal anybody's okay. thunder, but but uh, briefly, uh, uh, you know, my understanding as a medieval historian, um, now, or at least in the middle later part of the 20th century, maybe a little more complicated now, but but. Uh, recently anyway, uh, and who is an Arab? An Arab is somebody who speaks Arabic, right? And it was really, in the late 20th century, a major marker of political identity uh, in this part of the world. So Egyptians, for example, you know, were amongst the most enthusiastic uh, uh, Arab nationalists. Uh, I don't think it would have occurred to anybody much before the 19th century to have thought of themselves as an Arab in those terms. The term Arab means different things, and for some people, the it, you know, literally, the term Arab, Arab means a wanderer, a nomad, it's a Bedouin. Uh, and so it, it, it can and indeed sometimes still is used as a, as a, as a term of contempt. Yeah, Arab, I mean, you're just a boor, an unsophisticated guy wandering around in the desert on camels and uh, that sort of thing. It can mean different things, is my point. Um, and the notion that Arabness, an Arab identity based on language, should be the foundation of political identity is a relatively modern thing. The people that I study would not have thought of themselves as, as Arabs, not in any political sense. Yes, but there, oh here, the mic's coming around. Uh, Dr. Burke, you mentioned the, the three uh, major geographic sources for slaves in the pre-modern Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeastern Europe, and Central Asia. Uh -huh. I was wondering, uh, and of course, as you said, this is a big place over a great span of time, but is it known the relative sizes of those three slave populations in the Middle East? Uh, I, if it is, I don't know about it. Anything involving demography in the pre-modern period is, is, is tough there, because we just don't have much in the way of statistical data that, that, that is reliable at all. That figure that I gave you uh, for 17th century Istanbul, um, the Ottomans are a little bit different because they, they kept really good records. Uh, and so we do have some, some, some demographic data for that. But uh, I, I wouldn't want to speculate too much. <laughs> 
Uh, could you explain to us what's the difference between a sixer, a twelver, and what exactly is the idea of the Mahdi and the idea of occultation? Wow, okay, these are Shi'i questions. Um, uh, it's not sixers, it's seveners. Okay, well, yeah, right. Um, okay, so I, I said to you that you know, a Shi'i is somebody who thinks that basically that the Muslim community screwed up and that leadership of the community should have gone to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, and then to his descendants uh, after him, that they were the ones uh, whom God had chosen uh, as the locus of authority. They were the ones who were kind of sovereign over the world, and they knew what was right politically, religiously, uh, and all the rest. With the exception of Ali, who does become the caliph, the fourth, for, what is it, five years, a few years until he's assassinated, um, uh, none of them ever actually come to power. Um, um, the problem, one of the problems that the Shi'is have is that those, they called them the Imams, and the Imam was that individual in any generation who groups of Shi'is recognized as being the one that was chosen by God and vested with his authority. Uh, those Imams started to disappear. They started to go into occultation. And there were different reasons for this. Um, uh, a lot of it has to do probably with persecution on the part of the, 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 the Sunni uh, authorities. And there are different Shi'i groups who say that different imams, different descendants of uh, Muhammad were the ones who went into occultation. So, uh, the Twelvers, for example, who are far and away the largest Shi'i group, maybe 90% of, of Shi'is in the world today, uh, are Shi'is who believe that it was the twelfth Imam who disappeared. And by, what they mean by disappearing is that he went into hiding. He was taken into occultation, a kind of protective status. So um, he's still around. He's hiding somewhere, maybe in your closet back home, maybe under your bed up in the hotel room. You, you, nobody knows. But he's still around, and someday he will be revealed as, as who he is, and he will return then to establish the realm of truth and peace and justice and love beads and all the rest. Um, okay? So th those are Twelvers. But there are other Shi'i groups who believe that it was other Imams, other descendants of Muhammad, uh, who went into occultation. So, for example, there are a group known as the Seveners. The seventh Imam, the one that's usually a, sort of acknowledged as being the sort of the seventh, by the Seveners anyway, was a fellow named Ismail, who was the son of the sixth you mostly recognized Shi'i Imam. His name was Jafar. Jafar was a, a great scholar as well, a scholar of Islamic law. Um, and widely respected by, by you know, what we would now call Sunnis and Shi'is uh, alike. And according to the stories, and they're, you know, who knows, but they're, they're different stories, but according to some of the stories anyway, uh, Jafar appointed his son Ismail as his successor. Um, and that should have been the end of it because, of course, the, 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 the imam is infallible. He, he knows God's will, so he can't make a mistake. But there were problems. Um, and one of them was that Ismail was, by some accounts, a drunkard, and that wasn't good. And also, by some accounts, he disappeared. <laughs> he went into occultation before Jafar himself had died. Uh, and that was a problem, because uh, you know, the imam shouldn't make a mistake. So you know, what Twelvers would say is that, that Jafar didn't really do that, but he then appointed somebody, another son, and that son became the seventh imam, and the line continued on down through there. But there were some Shi'is who said no, uh, Jaffa really did appoint uh, Ismail as his successor, uh, and he can't make a mistake, so that was right. And um, Jaff and, and Ismail is the one who's he was taken into occultation. He's he's the one who will return. And there have been Ismaili groups actually who have claimed to be ja or the descendant of, of, of Ismail who have revealed themselves. There was a um, a dynasty in in North Africa in Egypt known as the Fatimids in the tenth. 11th, 12th century, uh, who established an Ismaili state based in, the city of Cairo was built by the, 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 the Fatimids. Um, they established a state that ruled over Egypt and Syria and even the Hejaz for almost two centuries. 
They converted almost no one to their form of Shiism. They were very unsuccessful in that sense, but they did build a really splendid state that, that survived for a while. And as I say, they built Cairo. They created the city of Cairo. Hi. I just had a quick follow-up to two questions back when we were talking about Arab identity. Mm -hmm. um, just more or less from a contemporary standpoint, would you say that those who identify as Arab, is that um, an identification that comes from them, or is it something that's a remnant of being imposed, like 19th century imperialism? I'm going to leave that for the modernists okay. who are going to speak okay. this afternoon to, to speak more authoritatively uh, about that. Uh, I think, it, from my perspective, I, think there, I can see both things, yeah. but I'll leave it to, to, to those who, 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 for whom that's really more their area of expertise. Um, hi. I was hoping you could talk to us on a comparative basis about sort of social mobility over the time frame you looked, mm -hmm. given that conversion was actually, for some, an option. Yeah. Um, comparing it to, say, Confucian societies or some others at that time, what, what could you tell us about that? Well, I can't compare it to Confucian societies because all I can tell you about Confucian societies is that they're East Asian. Um, <laughs> end of story. Um, uh, but. Social mobility is, is actually a, a really kind of interesting question. Um, and one thing to be said about it is that there probably was a lot more social mobility in uh, medieval Islamic societies than in, say, non-Western, in, in, in Western uh, societies, in part because you, you don't have really an entrenched aristocratic structure the way you do, say, in, in, in medieval and early modern Europe. Um, moreover, uh, it is one of the characteristic features of Islamic law that um, inheritance is distributed, property is distributed through inheritance in, in, in a precise formulas, right? So, um, you know, if I'm an, a man and I have a certain amount of wealth and I have uh, three sons and three daughters, each of them inherits a certain prescribed amount from my estate. There are a couple of interesting things about that. One of them is that the, the women inherit, females inherit, and that property is theirs. And they can do whatever they want with it. And that's an important thing to remark upon, right? Because if one of my daughters then has this money and she goes off and gets married, the, the property that she brings to the marriage is hers and her husband can't touch it. Okay, that was not true in Anglo-American jurisdictions until the passage of the Married Women's Property Acts in the late 19th century. Um, before that, um, if a woman came into marriage, any property that she brought automatically became her husband's. You wouldn't have 19th century British literature if that wasn't the case, right? <laughs> That's basically what, what all those novels are, are, are about. But in Islam, uh, that property is, belongs to the woman and her, her husband can't touch it. Um, now, there is an inequity to it because my sons inherit twice the portion that my daughters do. But you can see what happens then is that, is that it, by comparison to, say, uh, medieval England, where you have fairly strict rules of primogeniture, uh, estate property tends to get dispersed over time. And one consequence of that is a fair degree of social mobility. People move up and down the social scales. Now that's not to say that, that there don't become entrenched uh, families um, and there were various mechanisms for doing that. Uh, you could, for example, take your property uh, and create a religious endowment uh, uh, out of it um, and it stipulate how the income from that estate is to be distributed. And you could set those things up in a way that keeps the money more in the family. Uh, going forward. Uh, there were also, in particular, scholarly families that created veritable dynasties of, of jurists uh, who inherited uh, kind of knowledge and a certain degree of social status, which they could sort of pass on then to their own children as well. So there were uh, social gradations and there were mechanisms, strategies for perpetuating that over the generations, but by and large, there was, I think, a good deal more in the way of social mobility in the medieval Islamic world than in, say, um, uh, 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 medieval Europe. 
Now, there, uh, there were some ways of, of some other things too. For example, I mentioned that, that doctrine of Islamic law which said that a male guardian can intervene to uh, present the marriage of his female charge to somebody who is her social equal. Um, and there were a variety of grounds on which they could do so. Um, a woman, of course, could not marry a Jew or a Christian. A Muslim woman, girl could not marry a Jew or a Christian. Um, she could marry um, a converted Jew or Christian, a Jew or Christian would be converted to Islam, but her guardian was able to object to that uh, too because, that, because of, of, of the relatively inferior social status of the converted Jew. And he could, you could bas basically you could do it for three generations. And after that, the, that, that stigma disappears. Hello. Um, I was wondering, you had mentioned that several centuries ago, Iran shifted from Sunni to Shiite. Yes. I'm wondering, how did that occur? It, uh, it happened because of a, of a dynasty known as the Safavids. Um, the Safavids were um, originally a Sunni, or kind of Sunni, Sufi, wacky millenarian group uh, in eastern Anatolia in the, um, uh, well, the usual date is given as 1300, 1301 or something like that for the start of this order. And there were a whole bunch of these wacky Sufi, Sunni, Shi'i mixed up uh, uh, orders um, in, in the area at the time. And the Safavids were one of them. But they survived and uh, they, they acquire a kind of, a, they increasingly be, drift towards 12-er Shi'ism. And there are a lot of historical connections between Sufism and Shi'ism. Uh, which are very, very complicated and we probably don't want to get into right now. They're, they're not at all the same thing, but there are connections between them. And the Safavids kind of drift towards uh, Twelver Shiism, and they also take on an increasingly uh, militant and political edge. And what happens at the very beginning of the 16th century is they conquer Iran. Um, they're a Turkmen group, but they uh, conquer uh, Iran and uh, bring about the conversion of most Iranians to Twelver Shiism over the next hundred years uh, or so. And it was a very deliberate policy on their part. Uh, they um, constructed mosques and schools. Uh, they endowed such. They hired uh, uh, Shi'i scholars from Iraq and then later from Lebanon as well, brought them in and hired them specifically to indoctrinate the Iranian population in 12 Shiism and convert them to them. So from the Safavids on, uh, Iran is overwhelmingly 12 Shi. But before that, no. Before that, there were, there were pockets of Shiism in Iran, um, in uh, Qom and in Mashhad and some various other places. But the, the majority of the Iranian population was Sunni before the uh, six, uh, 16th, 17th centuries. Question over here. Thank you. I'd like to go back to slavery. I'm assuming that Islam repudiated slavery at some point. There was some revelation that that wasn't to be tolerated. And did they do it before Christianity did, and say, and uh, Judaism yeah. did? You mean like, like the Mormons sort of? Getting so revelation to at some polygamy. point, no. at some point, they change their minds, and I'm imagining that it's not something that's condoned or accepted in modern. Well, there was no, Islamism. there was no um, kind of formal uh, change of of Islamic policy, uh, in part because you can't have that kind of thing. I mean, there is no institution in the Islamic world that's capable of making those kinds of pronouncements. You don't have a, anything like the Catholic Church which can you know, declare that the, the pope is infallible when he's sitting, sitting ex cathedra or that, you know, whatever. You have an institution. And it's true in the Protestant churches, of course, as, as, as well. It's, authority is a little bit more diffuse, but it, it's there too. Um, in, in Christian churches, typically, there is a kind of a, an institutional body that is capable of saying, this is authentically Catholic, and this is not. In Sunni Islam, anyway, Shia Islam is a little different, but in Sunni Islam, you don't have anything like that. There's no formal body like that with, I mean, there are, in the modern world, there are institutions, uh, many of them created by states, which 
you know, kind of function in that way, but there is no universally recognized institution that is capable of making a definitive pronouncement like that. So if, if you want to know what happens to slavery in the modern Muslim Middle East, that's an interesting question. Um, and slavery is abolished uh, in Muslim countries at different times. Uh, the process of eliminating slavery uh, begin in the Muslim world begins in the early 19th century. Uh, and the initial stimulus to bring it about is, is foreign intervention. It's, it's the British, really, um, caught up in you know, the abolition movement in the early 19th century. It was the British who drove efforts first to suppress the trade in slaves. And by then, of course, the slave trade is primarily an African thing because other slave markets have have been closed. So the, you know, in the 19th and early 20th century, slaves that are coming into the Muslim world are, almo are almost universally coming from, uh, from, from sub-Saharan Africa. There are efforts to suppress the slaves' trade, uh, driven at first uh, by the British. And then um, there is an effort to end slavery uh, as well. It's complicated, though for a bunch of reasons, and, and one of them is that, you know, as I was saying, s slave status means something very different in the Muslim world than it did in our own societies. And so, you know, one of the problems that the people who wanted to suppress slavery encountered, say, in the, the Ottoman Empire, is that many of the officials of the empire were the sons of slaves, right? Because their mothers had been concubines. And here were the, they were ruling the country. And so to, 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 to reject slavery was in a way to reject an important component of family life. So it's not just about ending a practice which involves you know, one human being in, uh, having dominion over another. It's a much, much more complicated thing. And so there was resistance to efforts to end slavery itself uh, in many countries in the Middle East. The, 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 the movement does pick up steam and really gets going in the 20th century. Uh, it, by the early first decades of the 20th century in places like Egypt, what's left of the Ottoman Empire, for the most part, slavery is, 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 is gone and is illegal. Uh, but not everywhere. The last state, I believe, to outlaw slavery uh, was Saudi Arabia in 1962. But again, it's very complicated. Who were the slaves? Since they were, many of them were very much treated as members of the family. They'd been concubines. Um, there was a, there was a, a group of, of slaves too who uh, uh, were uh, hereditarily is the wrong term, but um, who constituted the, the 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 guardians of the prophet's tomb uh, in Medina, and they had a very kind of uh, exalted status. Uh, they were eunuchs, <laughs> which. <laughs> You know, has its own issues, but um, but but they had, <laughs> but they had uh, 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 a very important place in in that society. So eliminating slavery, it, it was not, you know, such a clear cut thing, as it was in the United States. It was much much more complex. I'm yeah. afraid I'm afraid we're going to have to bring this to a close. Join me in thanking uh, Professor. Oh, well, thank you.